the EU delegation, the permanent mission of Uruguay, both of whom are the co-facilitators for the resolution on the rights of the child, and UNICEF are convening this side event. Our panel today is taking place in follow-up to the interactive dialogue of the third committee of the UN General Assembly on the promotion and protection of the rights of child. And we'll be focusing on the theme, child rights and the SDGs, taking action to ensure no child is left behind. This topic was also the focus of the recently released Secretary General's report on the status of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. This side event will offer us an opportunity to shed light on children in their capacity as human rights holders, claimants and defenders. It will allow children's voices to be heard on the exclusion and marginalization that they face in the exercise of their rights. This includes child poverty, gender-based violence, disability inclusion, and the impact of climate change and environmental de degradation on their lives. This side event also serves as a reminder that a child rights approach is critical to implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. It is now my pleasure to briefly introduce the speakers who will pre be providing remarks today. We will hear opening remarks from Henrietta Four, the Executive Director of UNICEF. She has worked to champion economic development, education, health, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief in public service, the private sector and nonprofit leadership in a career that has spanned for more than four decades. She will be joining us today through a pre-recorded video. She will be followed by Dubraka Suka, who is the vice president of the European Commission for Democracy, a position she has held since 2019. She previously served as a member of European Parliament from 2013 to 2019. Later, we will hear from Dr. Pablo Abdallah, a Uruguayan lawyer and politician of the National Party. He is currently serving as president of the Institute of Children and Adolescents of Uruguay, a position he has held since April 1st, 2020. We will now hear from Executive Director Four from UNICEF. And as I mentioned, it's a video recording and it should just start in one minute. Thank you. Okay, we have a little problem with that sound, but we'll be working on it. If you could just bear with us for a moment. Thank you. Um, apologies, or we seem to be having some difficulties with the sound on the video. So perhaps we just move on to the next Okay, we have a little problem with that sound, but we'll be working First, on it. If you could just bear with us for a moment. Thank you. The EU and Uruguay and their distinguished representatives here with us today. Thank you for your strong leadership and for your leadership in advocating for the full realization of children's rights. Thank you to Meg Gardner. Um, apologies, Paul, we seem to be having some Lions, difficulties with the sound on the video. So perhaps we just move on to the and next. Most of all, Okay, we have a little problem with that sound, but we'll be working on it. If you could just bear with us for a moment. Thank you. Okay, we will move over to the video later when we are able to work out a few of the technological uh, difficulties, and we do apologize for that. 
Um, however, we will go on to our second speaker. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have the pleasure of hearing from the um, Vice Commissioner, Commissioner Dubraka Suka, the Vice President of the European Commission for Democracy. And I would like to pass the floor over to you with a warm welcome and a thank you for joining us today. Good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is Dubravka Šuica. This is my assistant's name on the screen. Thank you, dear Meg, uh, your excellencies, uh, esteemed speakers, ladies and gentlemen. I really want to uh, extend a warm welcome to young participants and speakers. I thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you today. Leaving no one behind is a principle that guides my work on a daily basis. My portfolio is all about people and it reaches across generations. Today, we are discussing the, this life motif in the context of the upcoming United Nations Resolution on the Rights of the Child, which focuses on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, so-called SDGs. I warmly welcome that focus. Children's rights are human rights, which the European Union and European Union member states are committed to respect, protect, and fulfill. This is enshrined in the European Union Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Treaty of the European Union, and the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. As we slowly emerge, maybe we are emerging from the global COVID-19 pandemic, it is all the more important to strengthen the link between the realization of child rights, the sustainable development goals and Agenda 2030. We need to close the inequality gap deepened by the pandemic and focus on the global efforts towards the leave no one behind approach. Let me highlight shortly some important work we have done this year in the European Union in that regard. The European Union strategy on the rights of the child illustrates how European Union actions that strengthen children's rights have a close impact on the realization of the sustainable development goals. It lays out very clearly the synergies between the different thematic priorities of the strategy and the objectives of the SDGs. For example, the Commission's political guidelines announced a zero tolerance policy on child labor contributing to the global efforts to end all forms of child labor by 2025, in line with SDG target 8.7. The EU strategy on the rights of the child com commits the European Union to step up efforts to ensure the supply chain of European Union companies are free from child labor. We have adopted an approach based on the premise that almost all policies will impact children in one way or another. Therefore, we have taken care to ensure that European Union strategy is comprehensive and looks at all European Union policy areas, all areas which are relevant for child rights. This is also how we look at the SDGs. I can name a few, gender equality, quality education, economic growth, and of course, decent work, climate change, health, water, and sanitation. These are only some of the very crucial objectives of the global agenda, which will have a direct impact, impact on children's lives and on the realization of their rights. The European Union strategy recognizes the specific needs of children for socioeconomic inclusion, in this vein, we also consider support to families as being essential. The recommendation adopted by the Council on 14th June, establishing European Child Guarantee, which complements our strategy, calls upon member states to guarantee access to quality key services for children in need, those who are vulnerable, and to support their families. The ultimate aim is to help lift children and their families out of poverty and to ensure an equal start in life for every child. I want to repeat this, for every child, equal start. Investing in children and young persons contributes also to the achievement of Sustainable Development Goal 1, 
by breaking the intergenerational cycle of disadvantage. Equality, non-discrimination and inclusion are key principle underpinning the child rights strategy. In this respect, the rights and needs of specific groups of children, children with disabilities, migrant children, children in poverty, children for LGBTY community, etc., have been integrated into each pillar of the strategy. The 2030 uh, agenda cannot be successfully achieved without children. Children need to be at the heart of its heart of its implementation. Therefore, the Euro European Union's child rights strategy has been developed together with children for a simple reason. They are not only the future, they are the present. As active citizens, they call for climate action, raise their voices to defend human rights and call out injustice when they see it. Children and teenagers are our agents of change and we must not spare any effort to empower them to actively listen and create and uh, create a much needed deliberative space for them. We need to learn how to follow them. And in conclusion, we should all strive to leave no child behind. We must reach out to the most vulnerable children to improve their health, to invest in their education, to strengthen child protection systems. In doing so, we will reach the, we will reach the sustainable development goals by 2030. Finally, as much as we all need to work together to achieve the SDGs, the same is true for the realization of the rights of the child. The European Union is proud to play a key role in the multilateral fora when it comes to protecting, promoting, and fulfilling the rights of children. We call on all other international, governmental, and non-governmental actors to join forces for this important cause for our present and for our future. And to end, as Mahatma Gandhi said it so well, be the change you want to see in the world. So let us be all that change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for those powerful words, and especially for reminding us that children are at the heart of the implementation of the SDGs, uh, that they are both the future and the present and have a powerful role to play as agents of change in developing solutions on a number of challenges. So uh, very, very well spoken and a wonderful foundation for the panel presentation uh, that will follow right now. So it's my great pleasure now to uh, move over to the children's panel. Uh, before I do so, just want to recall some brief housekeeping rules. Uh, we have interpretation available uh, for those of you who need it in French, uh, English, and Spanish. Uh, if you wish to raise a question, and again, we are looking for questions, not necessarily for comments. If you wish to raise a question for a panelist, uh, you can use the um, chat box. And just a reminder, once again, uh, that this is, um, this is being recorded. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Umu, who is 18, year old, uh, 18 years old from Senegal. She has learned to be a film director on the job by picking up a camera and giving a voice to those she knows best. Rooted in the daily struggles of the young girls of her community, the tales she tells are both intimate and universal. At a time when the pandemic has given way to a rise in domestic and, and sexual abuse, Umu enables teenage girls to speak freely about the issues they face. She also serves her community by leading group discussions with teenagers during which she both listens and educates them on important topics such as sexual harassment and violence. In doing so, she enables teenage girls to speak freely about the issues they face. She also serves her community by leading group discussions with teenagers during which she both listens and educates them on these important topics. Um, I'm going to ask two questions, a two-pronged question of Umu, and then she will take um, uh, you know, one formal response. Could you tell us about your work in promoting children's rights in general and girls' rights in particular, and then also help us understand what led you to do this? Over to you.
je disais merci. Euh, je vous remercie vraiment d'être ici aujourd'hui pour partager mon expérience avec vous. Euh, cela fait plus de cinq ans que je suis engagée dans la lutte contre les violences faites aux enfants, notamment à la jeune fille. Euh, j'ai adhéré à des clubs d'enfants, à des clubs de jeunes, où j'ai eu à bénéficier de beaucoup de formations grâce à l'appui de Chai Fun. Et je peux dire que ce sont ces formations qui m'ont permis d'avoir un certain leadership et un certain engagement vis-à-vis -vis de ma communauté. Et c'est par là que j'ai commencé à mener mon combat tout d'abord dans mon école, où j'ai eu à former un petit groupe d'enfants. On a commencé à prendre des initiatives, à implanter un jardin potager, à recycler les matières plastiques pour les revendre, pour que l'argent que cela va générer, euh, et les donner aux enfants qui en ont besoin, aux élèves qui sont en besoin et qui ne peuvent pas payer leurs frais de scolarité. Et c'est comme ça qu'on a mené, commencé à mener nos activités. Mais également, j'ai pris conscience que euh, la protection de l'enfant, c'est la santé, c'est l'éducation, mais également c'est l'environnement. Et l'école est l'endroit où, où nous passons la majorité de notre temps. Donc, nous devons faire de telle sorte que cette école-là soit propre, soit accueillante et soit euh, sécurisante pour que quand l'enfant vient, qu'ils s'y sentent en sécurité. Et c'est pourquoi on a commencé à mener d'abord ces activités dans notre école. Et dans mon quartier également, j'ai eu à former un petit groupe de jeunes filles, composé majoritairement de jeunes filles. Euh, on se regroupait quelque part dans des maisons communautaires, des fois chez euh, l'une de nos membres, pour discuter, débattre de certaines thématiques comme les mariages d'enfants. Et on a même eu euh, l'occasion de fêter l'année passée euh, la journée de la jeune fille. On n'a pas pu le faire en présentiel à cause euh, du COVID, mais on a pu le célébrer en, en ligne en, en soutenant la thématique des violences domestiques parce qu'on a vu qu'il y avait une recrudence des violences domestiques, notamment en période de COVID. Et c'est là qu'on s'est dit, pourquoi pas parler de ces violences domestiques-là? Et on a lancé des messages sur Internet. Il y a des gens qui ont réagi, qui étaient curieux de savoir ce qu'on faisait. On en a profité pour les sensibiliser. Et même des fois, dans mon école, je suis interpellée par des professeurs qui me demandent de venir dans leur classe pour parler aux élèves. D'habitude, ce sont les élèves de la troisième qui traite des thématiques de mariage d'enfants dans une si longue lettre. Et des fois, leurs professeurs me demandent de venir dans leur classe pour parler avec eux, les sensibiliser. En même temps, j'ai eu à faire une activité à face avec des jeunes filles qui n'avaient pas des moyens de payer le frais de scolarité. Et là, on a, on a écrit un projet on nous a financé le projet et on a fait de petits tableaux euh, sur desquels on a écrit des messages comme « halte aux violences faites aux enfants », ces genres de choses qu'on a ensuite revendu Et l'argent généré aussi, on a donné ça, on a donné ça euh, à ces jeunes filles-là. Pour dire juste que toutes mes activités sont centrées dans, dans tout ce qui est protection de l'enfance, euh, halte aux violences faites aux enfants, etc. Et j'ai eu à faire aussi des émissions radio, des émissions euh, qui parlaient de ces mêmes thématiques-là à travers la campagne au fil l'égalité, des émissions des fois qui passent sur euh, l'Internet, qui passent à la radio et les gens écoutent, je sensibilise sur l'éducation sur des filles, sur... Euh, euh, les mutilations génitales féminines, etc. Et par ailleurs aussi, je me suis intéressée au cinéma euh, à travers euh, une émission qui s'appelle Solo Page. Et cette émission, dans cette émission, j'ai eu à réaliser quatre petits films qui parlaient de la pédophilie, des mutilations génitales féminines, euh, de l'éducation des enfants, etc. Et je, je peux dire que c'est cela qui m'a motivée aujourd'hui pour que je me dise, pour, 
pourquoi je me dis que j'ai ma passion, c'est le cinéma. Je vais prendre ce cinéma-là comme arme pour lutter contre les violences faites aux enfants. Et j'ai même comme, comme projet d'écrire un film qui va porter sur les violences psychologiques. Parce que comme je vous l'ai dit, j'avais une amie, elle était, elle était victime de violences psychologiques à cause de sa forme. Elle était obèse et là, elle se faisait tout le temps violenter par ses camarades. Et au final, elle, elle prenait toutes sortes de, de, de choses pour maigrir. Et à la fin, ça a endommagé son estomac. Elle, elle, elle est morte à la fin et ça fait partie des choses qui me motivent. Et je compte continuer mon combat pour elle. Et je pense un jour que je pourrai réussir. Et ce qui me motive encore, euh, je ne sais pas, il n'y a pas de choses particulières parce que je me dis que moi, en tant qu'être humain, je ne peux pas être euh, insensible, inerte face euh, à la situation des enfants, face aux maltraitances que subissent les enfants. Nous sommes tout le temps dans nos quartiers euh, euh, spectateurs de cas de mariage d'enfants, de cas de viol. Et pourtant, nous ne disons rien, nous, nous restons les bras croisés et on finit par devenir des complices. Moi, je me dis que j'ai été enfant. Euh, je suis enfant et un jour j'aurai des enfants. Je ne veux pas que mes enfants euh, aient à subir ce que certains enfants sont en train de subir à, en ce moment. Donc, on doit faire de telle sorte que tous les enfants euh, bénéficient des mêmes droits, que tous les enfants ne soient pas laissés pour compte, que, que tous aient accès à l'éducation, à une famille, qu'ils puissent s'épanouir dans un environnement sain. Merci. Thank you very, very much, Uma, for your brave statement, for sharing your experiences to date, and also for give, filling us in about your passion uh, to address uh, some of these very poignant issues through a developing interest and talent that you have in film. So we'll be looking out for, uh, for your name on the cinema waves one of these days. But, but you're right to point out that psychological violence is cruel and it's equally as cruel as some of the physical violence that we see. So we appreciate your highlighting that and reminding us um, of this. Okay, so we are now going to go over to our next uh, panelist, and it's um, my pleasure uh, to introduce um, Yana. Yana is 18. She's part of the network of golden advisors to the Ombudsman in Montenegro. And in this role, she's been able to engage directly with children, setting up interactive workshops around their rights and educating them about access to justice. To make sure that these pupils have access to reliable and child-friendly information about their rights, she has helped create a brochure that was distributed in schools all over the country. Her work empowers children to be more knowledgeable about their own rights and to react in case of violations. So I have the following questions for Yana. Could you share some insights on the children who were the most left behind in Montenegro? And could you share examples of the work that you have been doing to help address some of the discriminations that they are facing? Over to you. Hello, everyone. Um, first, I want to express um, my appreciation for the opportunity to participate in this event. Um, the network of Golden Advisors of Ombudsman in Montenegro is committed to playing a very active role in protection of children's rights. There is a significant number of different groups of children in Montenegro. Our network of Golden Advisors identified as very vulnerable and in need for much stronger attention and the engagement of the whole society. Um, each of them is very different and requires a targeted approach. The list is very long, so let me first mention the ethnic minorities, children, Roma, Ashkazian, Egyptian children with disabilities, children in street situations, children consuming alcohol and drugs and having access to gambling, in addition to children who are facing mental health problems. Um, it is also critical to work with children with disabilities, despite 
progress, they're still facing limitations and obstacles to their inclusion, which is more on paper than dealt in with real life. Um, they are still not able to truly participate in all those things that make an actual childhood, unfortunately. Uh, they're often cut out because of practical reasons, such as not being able to enter certain buildings or institutions because of the architectural barriers. Also, they're still being the target of rude comments coming from their peers. They're, they still feel like they need uh they they are left out and that someone is friends with them just because they feel sorry for them um in our system they cannot find proper support both medical and social and children with disabilities often do not find and get help regardless of their problems um another example of group uh, groups who tend to be left behind are the uh, roma Ashkezi egyptian children who are the almost entirely left out in our system we talked a lot about the challenges they face, and as Golden Advisors, we give our best efforts to make them aware of guaranteed children's rights by law and explain how to access the judicial authorities. Um, I would like to add one more important category of children that has been under the radar so far. Those are the children from rural areas. We recognize them as children who uh, face many challenges in accessing a number of activities and facilities compared to the most children in urban settings. For example, many of those children live in harsh conditions in mountains, in schools there too, sometimes 10 students, unfortunately, regardless of their age, and they do extremely hard jobs in their households. Um, they have never heard of their right and are often not provided opportunities to talk about their situation to their teachers, to the government or ombudsman. Our mission is to visit and enter almost every rural school to inform and direct every student about their rights and access to justice. Um, personally, I consider this activity to be one of the most effective I have ever done since I got the chance to connect with them on a whole another level. Together with Ombudsman, um, we don't give up on the intention to educate all children without discrimination about children's rights and all available protection mechanisms. I consider that children need to be educated on their rights so they can recognize potential rights violations and then know who to talk to. We have been channeling our voice to parliament, ministries. We had a chance to talk to the president of the country. Our term is in government's council for the rights of the child, but sometimes we feel the authorities only want to picture with us for the media and give us promises they never keep. So we keep being persistent to teach children about their rights, and we will be raising a red flag whenever we feel it's necessary. We will give our best efforts to increase the engagement of children in order to secure that, that politicians will stop using us for marketing and stop giving us the bare minimum. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I really want to highlight and commend your comment about making sure that children are not considered or not tokened tokens for political purposes that you are seeking really active and genuine engagement and your highlight on the roma i know that the, that work has been done over time on this but it, you are right they are often invisible uh when it comes to global stats and of course the issues that you raised about um children with disabilities and this continual barrier to access so that they can genuinely rec uh, exercise their rights continues to be a problem. And that is going to be a good segue uh, to our video. We're going to now see a video on uh, UNICEF produced on children with disabilities. And following that, we'll come back to the rest of our panelists. Thank you again. Thank you. We spoke to children and parents around the world about their rights and alternative care. I live with my family, my sister, my mom, and my dad. I live in King's Kids Village. Christian lives with his dad, me, his mom, and his sister. Children with and without disabilities from around the world. Seth, 13, 
Ghana. When I was three or four years old, my mother died and then I came to live with Auntie Joyce. Joyce, Seth's aunt. Because Seth is related to me, I wouldn't want him to lose his culture, his kinship ties. Tuka, eight, Jordan. Mom and Dad came to the orphanage. They saw me and took me with them. Bernard, 16, Ghana. Bernard has a physical disability. I was living in a chaos in Jamestown. I was begging for food and money to take care of myself. So I poor found me and he brought me to stay with Grandma Yai. Natasha, 7, Ghana. I used to be with my mother and my mother died. Angela, mother, foster family. Taking care of a child who doesn't have a mother, doesn't have a father, it's even a blessing to you. Watching her grow like a girl child, the need, the love, which in the orphanage home, it is not so. Shada, 14, India. Our parents are poor, so they migrate to make a living. Our friends and neighbors take care of us while they're away. Imran, community volunteer. When the parents go out for harvesting, they keep their children at home, usually with grandparents who are supported by youth volunteers and the village committees. I watch over them, help them with their studies and their health. The I Call Helpline provided us with psychosocial support training. Yaroslav, 9, and Maxim, 10, Ukraine. When I was adopted, I was still very young, so I don't remember much about where I lived before. Natalia, mother, foster family. The children had been really neglected. Nowadays, they're doing a lot better because they've been with us for four years. And Kenya. I ended up in King's Kids Village when I was three months old. Martha, caregiver, King's Kids Village. Baby came to King's Kids is because the mom passed on. I like living in King's Kids Village because of the people and playing games. I can say that Pevi is better off with us here, but when the time comes, she also needs to be reunited back to the family. City, social worker, Malaysia. Uh, there was a couple who didn't know they had adopted a child with cerebral palsy. I help the families of children with disabilities through moral support, advocacy, and counseling. They accepted the child with an open heart. Christian, 9, Panama. Christian has cerebral palsy. Lynette, mother. The most important thing is support, family support. When he was born, they told me he wouldn't achieve anything, but Christian has achieved a lot, and it's because of all of us, the whole family. Ahmed, 16, Zaatari refugee camp, Jordan. Ahmed has cerebral palsy. Khaled, father. I'd give up my own life before I gave up an Ahmed. I couldn't spend one second apart from him because he's very dear to me. He's my whole world. The best place for a child like me is to live in a caring and lovely family. Everyone in my family are my friends. I like all of them. My message to children who have lost their parents is that they shouldn't lose hope because maybe an uncle or auntie or grandparents is somewhere who can make their life a better because the best place for a child is the family. Why am I so happy? Why will I stay happy forever? Because of my family. <laughs> UNICEF, for every child. Well, that was one inspiring and, and moving uh, video. And I really want to thank UNICEF um, for producing it so well. 
and for showing the love and support that families are willing to provide for adopted children. And I know from families I've spoken with who have children that might be suffering from a disability, um, they tell me that their children have gifts and insights that are that extend beyond their maybe immediate disability. It's such a, a mutual experience. And I think that comes through showing the strength and the dignity of every child, no matter what circumstances um, they're born with. So again, thank you very much for bringing that into our four. Uh, so our, um, we have a little challenge here. One of our young panelists, um, uh, Keenan is having a little challenge um, connecting with us. We all know what that's like with internet, not um, cooperating with us when we like. So we're now going to move over to our third uh, presenter, uh, Dr. Abdallah, uh, who is the, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, has a very interesting position in Uruguay where he's the president of a national commission on children and adolescents, uh, an attorney by background, uh, and someone we very much look forward to hearing from. Over to you, doctor. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, muy buenos días. Muchas gracias por, por esa presentación tan generosa. Quiero saludar muy especialmente a la señora directora ejecutiva de UNICEF, a la señora vicepresidenta de la Comisión Europea. Para nosotros es un gusto y un honor estar participando de esta instancia tan oportuna, convocada por la delegación de la Unión Europea, por nuestra misión permanente del Uruguay ante Naciones Unidas y, por supuesto, por UNICEF. Creemos mucho en la interinstitucionalidad del interno y creemos mucho en los procesos multilaterales en cuanto al abordaje y al desarrollo de las políticas de infancia y adolescencia con el horizonte ordenador de la Agenda 2030 fijada por Naciones Unidas y en el marco, por supuesto, de las obligaciones que todos los países hemos contraído con la suscripción y la ratificación de la Convención de los Derechos del Niño. En ese sentido, creo que además ha sido muy oportuno y queremos también muy especialmente, si se nos permite la dirección, saludar a nuestra misión del Uruguay ante Naciones Unidas, al señor embajador y al señor primer secretario Juan José Rivas. Creo que ha sido muy oportuno el, el lema, el, 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 la consigna que se ha establecido como eh, santo y seña o como referencia de esta convocatoria y de esta instancia cuando se proclama la expresión sin dejar ningún niño atrás. Me parece que esa expresión resume y sintetiza muy bien todo lo que está en el pensamiento y en la acción de, de nuestros países, de las distintas naciones, en el marco de las políticas de protección y promoción de los derechos de niños y adolescentes, que esa es sin ninguna duda la obligación que los estados tenemos. Entender a los niños como sujetos de derecho, entender a los niños, por lo tanto, como eh, sujetos en función de los cuales o eh, a partir de los cuales la acción del Estado debe centrarse en darles protección y amparo como corresponde, pero al mismo tiempo promoverlos en el acceso y en el ejercicio de sus derechos humanos en todos los casos. Creo que hablar de, de que no quede ningún niño atrás es hablar de esa perspectiva, es hablar de la necesidad de desarrollar procesos socioeducativos que independientemente de la situación particular en la que esos niños se encuentren institucionalizados a cargo del Estado o a cargo de sus familias en el ejercicio de la patria potestad, el Estado y la sociedad civil combinada y aliadamente deben permanentemente impulsar, por lo tanto, alternativas y opciones que continuamente deben perfeccionarse a los efectos del desarrollo individual, del desenvolvimiento personal y de la formación y del progreso social y educativo. Nuestra institución, el INAU, que es el órgano rector en materia de políticas de infancia en el Uruguay, tiene principalmente esa misión. Hablar de que los niños no quede ninguno de ellos atrás es hablar de la protección, es hablar de la promoción, es hablar de la prevención de las violencias, que vaya así... Eh, en los tiempos modernos que nos toca enfrentar, se multiplican y crecen de una manera alarmante y tienden a concentrarse particularmente en los niños en cuanto a la vulneración de sus derechos. Y el Estado, los Estados, sin ninguna duda tenemos una misión absolutamente central en esa perspectiva, que implica, por supuesto, el desarrollo de las políticas, pero que implica al mismo tiempo el crecimiento y la expansión en los territorios de la presencia estatal Reitero, en una alianza estratégica e inteligente con las organizaciones sociales consagradas 
a la promoción y la protección de la niñez, porque es a partir de esa presencia extendida en los territorios y en los lugares donde las cosas acontecen y en los ámbitos fundamentalmente de las regiones y de las zonas más desprotegidas o donde por lo tanto la presencia del Estado es más ausente, donde tenemos que hacer un esfuerzo por estar, porque esa es la manera de prevenir las violencias, esa es la manera de detectar las vulnerabilidades, esa es la manera de actuar sobre ellas y esa es la manera en última instancia de cumplir con esa doble misión, la de la protección y la de la promoción. Quiero muy especialmente destacar, porque es uno de los actores centrales en esta instancia de hoy, la labor que UNICEF cumple, que el Fondo de las Naciones Unidas para la Infancia cumple en esta perspectiva, ayudando a todos los países, y lo digo por supuesto a partir de la experiencia uruguaya. Nuestra relación con UNICEF es una relación fecunda, es una relación ventajosa y provechosa para el Uruguay, facilitadora en cuanto precisamente al desarrollo de todas estas líneas estratégicas, en función de lo cual, por lo tanto, contamos siempre desde UNICEF y a partir de UNICEF y con el nexo de UNICEF, con la posibilidad de lo que yo dije al principio, de reconocer la necesidad de la multilateralidad, la necesidad de integrarnos a procesos de eh, interacción con la región y con la comunidad internacional que también resultan indispensables a estos efectos. Y finalmente, porque no lo mencioné antes, hay un aspecto que hemos compartido y compartimos con UNICEF y trabajamos siempre, él, siempre en él, que es una suerte de, de horizonte ordenador de las políticas de infancia en la actualidad en el Uruguay y que tiene que ver con el derecho a vivir en familia. Cuando hablamos de proteger y de promover, por supuesto que eso se da en el marco de asegurar los derechos básicos, de darle seguridad y garantía desde el punto de vista de la sobrevivencia, de la salud y del acceso a la educación y a los bienes básicos, a los niños cuando lo necesitan, pero todo eso, por supuesto, enmarcado, que no debe perderse de vista, en la necesidad de la vinculación y la revinculación familiar, porque todos los seres humanos tenemos derecho a, a educarnos y a crecer en el ámbito de la familia, como lo establece la Convención de los Derechos del Niño y como en nuestro caso lo establece el Código de la Niñez. En eso también trabajamos con UNICEF y en eso estamos trabajando en la actualidad en el desarrollo de políticas muy claras y muy concretas que apuntan precisamente al reconocimiento de ese derecho primordial que es el sistema de protección más perfecto y que es el ámbito adecuado para que todo lo demás, por lo tanto, que mencionamos antes, se pueda desarrollar con la mayor plenitud. Así que muchísimas gracias por esta instancia y felicitaciones una vez más a la Unión Europea y a la UNICEF y el, a Naciones Unidas en general y el reconocimiento a la misión permanente del Uruguay por formar parte también de esta convocatoria. Doctor, thank you very, very much for your comments. And I think a few things that we pulled out from the many things that you said um, is this uh, ensuring this double mission that we all have, both um, to protect children uh, to, and to promote their rights. That protection and promotion are two very strong key principles that guide a lot of our work. And we do want to thank you for affirming the central role and importance of the family and raising children. And I think all of us are committed to doing what we can to make sure children can live with their families safely and that parents are equipped with what they need uh, to care and protect for their children. So um, Im important messages, things that we're hearing reinforced through the young people who are speaking today. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so now we're going to just shift a little bit. We're going to go back to that initial video that we had hoped to hear from, from Executive Director Four. We're, we're going to hear from her first. Uh, and then we hope by that time that the technology will improve and we will be able to connect with Keenan. Thank you. Morning, good afternoon. It is my my pleasure to join you today for this critical discussion on putting
Putting children's rights at the heart of SDG implementation. This is an opportunity for us to make real the pledge of leaving no child behind. First, I want to thank UNICEF's co-host, the EU and Uruguay, and their distinguished representatives here with us today. Thank you for your strong leadership and for your leadership in advocating for the full realization of children's rights. Thank you to Meg Gardner, Secretary General for the Child Fund Alliance, who has generously agreed to moderate this session. And most of all, I offer my special thanks to our three young panelists, Jana from Montenegro, Keenan from Indonesia, and Umu from Senegal. All three are adolescents who stand up for the rights of the most marginalized in their communities and beyond. We are proud and grateful to learn from you. And I am inspired by your activism, which is critical given the state of the world today. Across the globe, we are confronted with a true child rights crisis in which children face ongoing rights violations, persistent and systemic discrimination, and inequalities deepened by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Climate change and humanitarian crises also pose major challenges for us all. At the same time, economic instability is disrupting essential services for children and making it harder for families to make ends meet. More than 1.2 billion children are living in poverty and only one in four children have access to any benefit scheme. School closures due to COVID-19 continue in many countries. As a result, School children around the world have lost an estimated 1.8 trillion hours of in-person learning, and this is increasing. Children have been cut off from their education and the other vital benefits that schools provide. Rates of domestic and gender-based violence are on the rise, especially in the most vulnerable communities and households. The number of children in child labor has risen to more than 160 million worldwide, with millions more at risk due to the impacts of the pandemic. Malnutrition continues to persist in all of its forms, with children paying the highest price. And approximately 1 billion children, nearly half the world's children, live in one of the 33 countries classified as extremely high risk for the impacts of climate change. These children face a deadly combination of exposure to multiple climate and environmental shocks and high vulnerability due to an inadequate essential services such as water and sanitation, healthcare and education. Child displacement is also on the rise. An estimated 36 million children more than ever before are living in displacement due to conflict, violence and disaster. These are incredibly difficult times for the world's children, and those children who are already the most vulnerable, marginalized, and discriminated against could be left behind unless we take action. A child rights approach must be central to implementation of the 2030 Agenda. Child rights must not be an afterthought, but a core consideration of all national, regional, and global policies, frameworks, and legislations. We must also recognize the pivotal role of children themselves, who both online and offline are increasingly calling for a realization of all their rights. They want to be part of the change, participants in creating and implementing solutions. In this spirit, I look forward to hearing and learning from Jana, Heenan, and Umu today. I also look forward to working with all of you to advance the realization of the rights of all children, including those most discriminated against and marginalized. I thank you and wish you a very productive Okay, well, I, I know we had a little challenge with that video, but the message from ED4 was very compelling. She shared a number of statistics with us about the impact of COVID. And I would just like to highlight one thing she said that I was unaware of that we, of course, we know that school closures due to COVID continue in many countries. But what I didn't realize that as a result, school children around the world have lost an estimated 1.8 trillion hours 
of in-person learning. Boy, is that a fact that we should be taking out with strong advocacy uh, to our education ministries and governments. 1.8 trillion hours lost. Um, it's almost hard to get your head around that. Okay, now I'm going to see if we have the benefit of uh, having our colleague, our young colleague from Indonesia, Keenan, to connect with us. Um, if that is possible, we will turn um, this over to Keenan. If, if we do not have the internet capability, we'll, we'll start with some uh, questions and answers, but just one more try. Uh, Keenan, can we connect with you? Hey, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can, welcome. Okay, so while you're here, may I introduce you? Okay, I'll, I'll come back over now and make my introductions. Just want to make sure um, that you were here. Okay, and we're very glad that the, uh, the internet's cooperated. Okay, so Keenan, 16, is a filmmaker and a photographer from the Dayak Iban tribe, which is indigenous to the island of Bor uh, Borneo in Indonesia. He documents the traditions, the beliefs, and the stories of his tribe in films and pictures with the aim to pass them down to the next generation. He raises awareness globally about the knowledge his community has regarding the forest and how to manage it. In 2019, he traveled to the UN in New York with other members of his community to accept the Equator Prize for their efforts. There he learned that his tribe's fight belongs to a larger global movement for indigenous land rights. And since then, He's been advocating for land ownership of indigenous communities, promoting the impact they could have in protecting forests and mitigating climate change. Keenan, could you tell us about your work in advancing the rights of indigenous peoples? And could you also tell us what led you to stand up for the rights of your community? Over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm so excited to be here tonight and my deepest apologies for being late. And I guess, I should start with um, the story of our village, Sungai Utik. Um, for decades, the people here, our elders, my father, my grandpa, have protected our forests from outside interests and such. And because of that, the forest still to this day is still pure, is still, is still lively. And when I asked them why they did that, why did they protect it so, so resiliently? And they always tell me that it's because they want to pass it on to the future generation. They want to pass it on to their kids like me so that we, the younger generation, can understand what it was like for them, for them to grow up, grow up between all the trees and to experience, to experience a life in the forest. And, and because of that, I also understand the importance of the forest. It is our way of life. And that's something that can never be taken away from us. But that's the very thing that has been happening in many, many communities throughout our area and throughout the world, really. Indigenous communities having their forests and territory taken from them without their consent or even notice at times and through less than non-violent ways at that. And for me, that is the biggest thing. I just want for indigenous people, indigenous communities like mine and others to have the rights that they should have as the native people of the land, as the indigenous people of the land. Because we're, when we're trying to fight for our rights, we're not, we're not asking for it. We're tr trying to take back what should be rightfully ours. Okay, thank you very, very much, Keenan. Unfortunately, um, I've been told that we do not have enough time for questions. We have uh, just about four minutes left. Um, so um, now I'm, I'm getting the message that we can go five over, over five minutes if needed. So I guess what this means is that we probably might have time for one, one question. Um, so I'm just checking the box to see if there's any um, questions that have come in. Um, and you know, if there are, we'll, we'll attempt to uh, raise them. Um, and if not, maybe I will just put a very general, maybe just a very general question out um, to the young adult panelists, the child panelists, and then just ask them um, if they would like to respond. 
So I think I'm going to do that uh, since I'm not seeing anything in the chat. So this question goes out to any of the three child panelists who would like to, to re reply. One person can reply, all three can. Could you tell us about some of the challenges you've been facing in raising awareness about children's rights in your community? And based on that, could you share any tips uh, for other children who would like to take action to ensure that no child is left behind? And we know that talking about child rights is challenging work. Not everyone wants to accept that children have rights. You must have encountered challenges. Uh, we would all benefit from learning how you've overcome these. And I think the next generation of advocates are also very uh, eager to hear this as well. So the questions out there for Keenan, for Umu, um, and for Yana, who, who would like to respond? Just raise your hand. Okay, I see Yana raising her hand, over to you. Um, thank you very much for your question. Um, of course, there, there have been and there will always be challenges when it comes to this particular topic. Uh, like I said above, when it comes to children from rural areas, the approach, both technical and social, is what uh, matters the most, and it is also the biggest challenge we have faced so far. Um, also, uh, Roma, Egyptian, and Ashkaza children have been hard to teach sometimes about their rights because of their unique culture. So both approach and understanding are needed for solving, uh, solving this problem because not everyone uh, comes from the same environment. Um, and when it comes uh, when it comes for tips, um, kids need to raise their voice, um, whatever it is that they're facing, um, any kind of problem, they need to stand up. It doesn't matter which culture or, or environment they're coming from, uh, regardless of their age, skin color or nationality, help is always available if you raise your voice and stop being quiet. To all the kids around the world, to the kids from my country, no matter how low life may seem sometimes, you are not alone. And please, please speak up about your problems. Thank you. Thank you. A very strong message of encouragement, uh, solidarity, and support um, for child advocates um, in their own communities. We appreciate that. Uh, Umu or Keenan, would you like to respond? Yes, I see Keenan has his hand up. Over to you. Thank you. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that we face here is the um, stereotypes or the stigma surrounding our culture, uh, specifically Dayaks. And because we've always been taught, we've always been thought of as sort of backwards or behind in terms of development and such. And I think that's one of the biggest things that discourages our younger generation from wanting to preserve our culture or even to go back to their villages. But also the other biggest problem I think is just the corrosion of culture that has happened. Because for the past few decades, that's something that every, every single indigenous communities in our region, in our country has experienced the corrosion of culture caused by the destruction of their natural territory, but also by, by the modern way of living. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we need to work on to say for, to say for especially indigenous youth, to be proud of our roots and to take, to take action about it because there's so many things that can be done. And as Yana said earlier, we need to raise our voice because there is just such a big necessity for it because if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And for reminding us of the powerful role of stigma and the constant, uh, the constant challenge to break through stigma and change perception. Th thank you for raising that. Over to Umu. Uh, pour moi, des fois, il y, y a des gens, il uh, y, y a même des parents qui viennent vers moi pour me dire que uh, de, de laisser leur enfant parce que ils ont commencé à changer de mentalité. Moi, je ne comprenais pas après, c'est après que j'ai eu à parler aux enfants. Après, ils m'ont dit que leurs parents pensent que 
ce que je suis en train de faire, c'est pour, euh, je ne sais pas, faire autre chose. Et après, je suis partie vers eux faire une visite. Je leur ai expliqué réellement ce que j'étais en train de faire. Et c'est là qu'ils ont accepté euh, de, de laisser leurs enfants me fréquenter, tout ça. Je me dis qu'on n'a on a, on a pas écrit nos droits, tout simplement pour les afficher, pour les contempler. On les a écrits pour qu'ils se fassent respecter et non qu'ils se fassent bafouer. Donc, on a nos droits, comme tout le monde, on a des droits. Et on doit les faire respecter par nous-mêmes, par vous, par un combat qu'on doit mener et qu'on doit coûte que coûte réussir. Parce que les enfants sont l'avenir. Euh, ils sont censés être de futurs euh, hommes demain. Donc, faisons tout pour réussir ce combat-là. Thank you, Uma, and for reminding us that the, the success that we will, we will be striving toward in this ongoing struggle um, for human rights and justice. So we have only two minutes left. Uh, so we are going to have to pull uh, a close to our panel. Um, I would like to thank uh, the European Union, Uruguay, UNICEF, uh, for bringing all this together. My name uh, is Meg Gardner. I'm the Secretary General of uh, Child Fund Alliance, and it's been my privilege to moderate today. And I want to thank Manel and Ratna at UNICEF for making this job very easy. They prepped me very, very well, uh, and I deeply appreciate that. Um, I also want to acknowledge that uh, Child Fund works with a network of child-focused agencies, which include Plan International, Save the Children, SOS Children's Villages, Terre des Almond World Vision, uh, when, when we speak at events, whether we're Child Fund or another organization, we really do represent uh, that voice and intent of um, child-focused civil society. So, so my presence here today is an expression of support from uh, many child-focused agencies who work both in New York and Brussels and Geneva and around the world uh, with, with many of you. And just what a, uh, a learning opportunity this has been uh, for, uh, for us. It continues to be a great opportunity uh, during these Zoom calls to bring young people in from around the world and to engage them and to learn, to learn from young people. As our commissioner said um, in the beginning, we are learning from young people who are agents of change uh, in, in these very challenging and complex times. So once again, thank you. Thank you to everyone, uh, the young people, the presenters, uh, the hosts, all of you who you know, patiently sat through this hour with many competing demands in your own uh, schedules. Um, it has been a great pleasure and a learning opportunity. Have a good evening, good afternoon, good morning to all. Thank you. <laughs>